powerful morning in the presence of the Lord. And I just, you know, when you're prophetic, you just keep hearing and hearing and hearing and hearing. And I really believe the Father wants me to remind us today that we're pioneers. Look at someone and say, you're a pioneer. Amen. You're a pioneer. What does that mean? That means we're doing things and going places no one has been. And God wants to open up this nation to the outpouring of His Spirit like never before. Amen? In order to do that, we've got, we have to be willing to do things we've never done. We've got to be willing to allow God to use us like we have never been used before. And I think that what one thing God is doing, He's creating a new culture within the house. Testing one, two. Amen. He's creating a new culture. That means that the old ways have passed away and things are becoming new for us. Why do we need new things? Because the old things wasn't working. Amen. They work for a season. And in every season, God begins to do new things. Not only with just the Word or revelation or or worship, or those types of things. God, He brings us from faith to faith and from glory to glory. Amen? We're entering into, I say entering, we've stepped into, let me rephrase that. We have stepped into the greatest times the earth has ever seen. And God is pouring His Spirit out in new ways. He's not going to use just the five-fold ministry to do that. He's going to use you, the believer. We're going to look at some of that this morning, but God is empowering the church to be the church. He's moving us from just going to church to being the church. Look at someone and say, you're the church. Amen. You're full of the glory and the power of God, and God wants to pour that through your life. The church is a very important part of the kingdom. I want you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 16. And we're going to talk a little bit about the church, who we are. And and the Lord asked me this question some years ago, and I've been on a journey to try to figure it out, and, and, and I'll share some of what I've seen and heard. But the Lord asked me this question. He said, Greg, what do you think I want my church to look like? Wow, several revelations in that one question. Number one is His church. Amen? And he has in his mind and in his heart what he wants his church to look like. Probably if we took a survey in here today, we'd have many ideas of what we think the church should look like. How it should operate, how it should function, what it should do in the community, all these things. But I got good news for you this morning. You don't have to think that hard because Jesus has already laid it out for us what he wants his church to look like. Can you say amen? Let's just read. Let's just start with verse 13. It says, when, when, uh, Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea Philippi, He was asking His disciples, Who do people say the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, others Elijah, still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And He said unto them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ the Son of the living God. And Jesus said unto him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you, Peter, that upon this rock I will build my... What? Say it loud. Church. And the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven... And whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. So, Father, this morning we thank you for your word. We thank you it's alive, it's powerful, it's sharp, and it's doing its work in our life. Holy Spirit, help us to see and to hear what you're saying to your church today in Jesus' name. Now, there are several things in this passage that are very powerful. Jesus starts out on this journey with His disciples along the coast of Caesarea Philippi, and He's asking them, Who do men say that I am? Who is the world? How are they identifying me? 
And they spoke up and they said, well, some say that you're John the Baptist. Well, John just lost his head a little bit before that, right? And, and they really believed in reincarnation. There was a big mixture around in, in the Jewish faith at that time. And how I many you know when you die, you're not coming back as nothing? Amen? There is no reincarnation. The next time you come back, you'll be coming back with Jesus when He returns. But in that day, like today... There's a lot of mixture in the church, in the Jewish religion even. And they said, you might be John the Baptist, you might be uh, Jeremiah, you might be one of the prophets. And then Jesus turned the table on them. He said, who do you say that I am? See, it really doesn't make a lot of difference what the world says about Jesus. What matters is, what do you say? What are you saying about Christ? What are you, who do you say that He is? Is He just some religious figure that's hung way out in the world somewhere? Maybe one day you'll see Him when you die. Or is He really the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Is He the Prince of Peace? Is He the one, the Son of God that has come to set us free and bring us into who He's called us to be? That's who I believe He is. Now, look at Jesus' response. When Peter said, you're the Christ, the Son of the living God, Jesus said unto him, you are blessed. See, when you get a revelation of who Jesus is, you can begin to get a revelation of who you are. Oh, don't shout too loud on Sunday morning. Yeah. When you get a revelation of who Jesus is, you can begin to, begin to get a revelation of who you are. And he said to Peter, you are are blessed. Why? Because Peter identified him as the son of the living God. Woo, man, there's a lot right there. We ain't got time for that today. He said, you're the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus said unto him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona. Why? Because flesh and blood has not given you this revelation. He said, but my Father who is in heaven. Everybody say, in heaven. Here's a little something. Write this down. Every time that Jesus begins to talk about the Father, He always speaks of His geographical location. He identifies God as being in heaven, or the Father being in heaven. Why? Because the Father did not, has never been in the earth. He's not been here. He said in Matthew 6.10, when you pray, pray this way. Our Father who is where? In heaven. Jesus is saying here, our Father in heaven has shown you this thing, right? So the Father, that's very important to understand today, His dominion or His domain is heaven. The Scripture says that God created heaven for Himself, but He created the earth for the sons of men. God created the earth for you. Write down Genesis chapter 1, verse 26 and 27. We'll refer to that here in just a few minutes to bring clarity to why you're here on the earth. He says here, the Father who is in heaven, He has revealed this to you. And I say to you, Peter, upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it, and I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth, look at this, shall have been. You see that? Shall have been bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. There's several keys here for us understanding what the church is for. Now, I've said this a couple of times, and you may have heard me, but God never anywhere, Neil, told us to go to church. Never ever told us to go to church. He said, be the church. How do we know He said, be the church? In this passage of Scripture, when He used the word church, He was not using a, Jew, a, a, a Jewish term. He wasn't using a term that was a religious term. He was using a cultural term. He was using a term that was known to the Greeks that the Romans had adopted and began to use in their culture. 
Now, to understand this word, we have to understand what the Greeks meant when they used the word church. The word church is the word ekklesia in the Greek. And the word ekklesia in the Greek, or to the Greeks, it meant the elders that sat at the gate that determined who came in and out of the city. Jesus said, I'm going to build an ecclesia, and they're going to be a people that are going to sit at the city, at the city gates or the city borders, and they are to determine what comes into the city and out of the city. The word church is not a spiritual term that, or something that you join till you die and go to heaven. It is a force in the earth that has authority in the earth to shape and change culture to make the kingdom of God come into the earth. Hallelujah. we got to understand, church is not somewhere you go. Church is who you are. You may say, well, why don't we come together? Because the writer of Hebrews, he said, do not forsake yourselves the assembling together. Why? The word assembly is also a governmental word. Some nations use the word assembly to identify their senate. Which brings me to the Roman definition of the word ecclesia. The Roman definition of the word ecclesia, it literally means senate. Everybody say senate. Only three of you did. Come on, participate with me. Say senate. There we go. This is participation preaching. Hallelujah. You know, Romans were warriors. You see a, 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 a soldier, Roman soldier, you see his armor. Paul used the Roman soldier to identify how we're to put the armor on and all that. You, when you think of Rome, you think about conquerors. And Romans went in and they conquered cities. And when Rome would conquer a city, they didn't conquer it just to loot it. Rome had the idea of literally when they conquer a city to change the culture of the city. So what Rome would do, church, is they would take an ecclesia and they would send it into this new territory that had been conquered by Rome. They would send in the ecclesia. They would send in the church. They would send in, now don't, when I say church, it's not a religious group. It's a governmental entity known to the Romans as their senate, their legislative body. And when the church, the ecclesia, would go into this new city, their responsibility was to change the culture of the city. You see, there's a lie in the church today that says in the states, and I've heard it's here too, and we need to uproot it, we need to lay the axe to the root of it, that says that there needs to be and there must be a separation between the church and the state or the church and government. That is a lie from the bowels of hell that has been given to the church, force-fed to the church, until we believe it. We, the church, have been set into the culture, into the state, into this area as a legislative arm of heaven. Woo! And our job... Listen, listen, listen. If you're religious, just hang on. Cover your ears because this is going to make you nervous, but we're going to help you with it. The church's job is not to get people into heaven, but the church's job is to get heaven and earth. Hallelujah. As a matter of fact, when you die, you will get to go to heaven. But there's this thing called the return of Christ, which means he is returning to earth. Not heaven. Earth. You're not going to be a little naked baby floating on a cloud playing a harp throughout eternity. That's not who you're going to be and tell your neighbor, praise God for it. Amen. You are the legislative arm of heaven in the earth. God has put us here not to just have a say-so in what happens in our cities and community, but to have the say. When Jesus prayed, he said, pray this way. Again, our Father who is in heaven, 
He's on his throne there ruling well. Our Father who is in heaven, holy is your name. Your kingdom come. Send something out of heaven that we can use to cause earth to look like heaven. Whoa! I feel this, brother. I feel this thing. That changes everything. Church is not singing songs and hearing a sermon. Church is coming together and legislating, being an ecclesia in the region that God has set you to cause the kingdoms of this world to become the kingdoms of our God. Hallelujah! you got to get involved. It's your assignment. And we break the lie over our lives and over this nation that says we should not be involved in government. It is the totality of our assignment because we are a governmental entity, not a religious entity. Isn't that amazing? He said, I'm going to build my ecclesia. The Romans, when they went into a town, they changed everything. They changed culture. And they did it by a decree of Caesar, a commissioning from Caesar. God has commissioned us to go into every sphere of society and bring His kingdom. Can you say amen? It's your job. Paul referred to you as an ambassador. That's not a religious term. That is a governmental term. This is about the government of heaven. Isaiah chapter 9, you quote it all the time at Christmas. It says the government will be upon his shoulder and to his kingdom there will be no end. Jesus did not come to bring us a religion. He came to bring us a government that brings relationship restored as sons and daughters in the kingdom. Woo! If we're going to be effective, if we're going to have revival, if we're going to have awakening in this nation, it's not coming through a religious experience. If it could, it would have already. It's coming through an ecclesia arising in the land, bringing the governmental authority of heaven through every believer's life in every area God's called you to serve in, in the community, in a way that heaven lands where you put your feet. You know what that means? That means it's greater than he that is in you than he that is in the world. That means when Jesus said, I've given you authority in Luke chapter 19, He said, I've given you authority to trample on the heads of serpents and scorpions and all the powers of the enemy, and nothing by any means shall harm you. That word authority is, the, is, is a word that, uh, it, it's, not, it's not dunamis, it's not energeio, it's the word exousia, which means governmental authority. You will stand as a king in a realm and release the authority of God. That's why Peter said that, you're key, that Jesus is the king of kings. He is the Lord of lords. You are lords. Look at somebody say, you are lords. Ah, you have a little better understanding of it than what Americans do because of your British background. I hope I don't offend anybody. If I do, just it's American ignorance. Hallelujah. What does it mean? What does the word Lord mean? The word Lord, it simply means the one who is control, in control of the land and the finances of the king. Yeah, I like to be a Lord. Lord doesn't mean somebody that dies on the cross. The King Jesus, He did that. And when we say Jesus is Lord, we're literally saying He is owner. He is owner. The word Lord means owner. The Lord is the owner. He's in control of the land and the finances. We need to begin to be in control of the land and the finances that are in the earth. God is raising a people up that are striving and forcing their way out of religion into the kingdom. Jesus literally said they are forcing, they are pushing their way out of their religious experiences into the kingdom of God. 
The word church, ecclesia, to the Romans, when they would go into a city, this is what they would do. They would change the food that they ate. They would change all of the, the, the way, the, the garments that they wore. They would change the name of the streets. They would change the architectural structure of the buildings to look like Rome. If you ever have a chance to go to Israel, and we try to go a lot, I'd love for you to go with us, you'll see in, in, in Jerusalem Roman and Greek architecture. You'll see buildings. You say, this doesn't look Jewish. No, because the Romans conquered and they changed the culture. Greek and Roman architecture. They would even go in and they would change the currency that people used. Why? You remember the story in the Scripture where they, brought Je they came to Jesus and they said, should we pay our taxes? Y'all remember that? And as Jesus said, give me, a, give me a coin. And they gave Jesus a coin, and they said, whose face is on the coin? And they said, Caesar's face is on the coin. And he said, give unto Caesar what is Caesar's, and give unto God what is God. The Jews were using coins that had Caesar's face on it. Why? Because the Romans had changed the currency in the process of changing the culture. We need to understand today that we are in, Neil said it so beautifully this morning, we are in a divine opportunity of God, and we have to seize this opportunity to shift out of religion into kingdom. It's totally different. Religion has no part in kingdom. Jesus didn't come to bring religion. He came to bring us a kingdom. Can you say amen? He told Peter here, look at this in verse 18. He said, I also say to you, Peter, that upon this rock I will build my church. Now let's go back to the question. What does Jesus want His church to look like? If the church that Jesus wants in the earth does not look like what He desired, is it really His church? Selah. Now that's important. I'm the kind of guy, I want to get things right. I don't want to stand before God and say, well, you did your thing, but it wasn't my thing. You gathered together, but you didn't gather together as my church. You gathered together as a religious organization to do religious things that you attributed my name to. Come on, smile at me on Sunday morning. Amen. We've got a shift. And you know what? With this shift brings a divine power that sets everything in your life in order. Mm. Woo, why did Jesus, why did Jesus walk around and, and was able to heal the sick? It was not a religious experience. When Jesus stepped out of the boat and the Gadarene ran to Jesus and he said, Why are you here? The King Jimmy version says, to torment me before my time. The translation of that is, why are you here to bind me before the time? Binding is not a religious word. It is a governmental word, which means to take captive and imprison. Wow. See, when you pro approach a, somebody possessed by a demon, and a lot of times they don't get free, is because we're trying to do it through a religious experience. Oh, Lord Jesus, help us, help us, Jesus, 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 help us. Woo, glory to God. Help us, Lord, help us, Lord. Come out in the name of Jesus. Ah, I ain't coming out. Me and all my brothers ain't coming out. Why is that? Because we're approaching them from a position of religion or an experiential position instead of a position of authority. That's why Jesus said, you will cast out devils, which literally means they are trespassing in my ground, evict them from my property. Yeah. And you can say, in the name of Jesus, you must go. And they must go. The Scripture says every knee will bow 
every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is owner. Woo! Hallelujah! He is Lord. Church, God is shifting us into a place that you are more dangerous than you could ever imagine. You're more powerful than you could ever imagine because the spirit that raised Jesus from the dead, he is living in you and making alive your mortal bodies to stand as sons and daughters in the earth to release the kingdom of God as the governmental arm of God, the ecclesia in the earth. Woo! Hallelujah! Jesus said, when I build my church, the powers of Hades will not overpower it. One of my, this is one of my favorite geographical locations in Israel, is Caesarea Philippi. And when we take groups there, Neil, we stand and there are two caves up there where they threw babies in for sacrifices. Those two caves were called the gates of hell. Literally, that was their name. Religion says that the gates of hell are maybe in the center of the earth where the devil rules and reigns and everybody that don't know Jesus goes. No, that's not what it was. Jesus was speaking of a cultural experience that was happening right there in their day that was hindering the kingdom of God in the earth. And he was telling them what they're doing up there will not overpower what I'm doing in you. You will overtake what they're doing. And the gates of hell will not overpower you. Then Jesus said, not only is there a power in my church, He said there are keys in my church. He didn't give us a keys to a church because the church is not the entirety of the kingdom. It is a piece of the kingdom. He gave us keys to the kingdom of God, to the kingdom of heaven. Amen? Now, just a brief definition. The kingdom of heaven and the kingdom of God are two different things in their mode of operation. The kingdom of heaven is where God is touching everything else. The way I would have to explain it today, and, and pardon me for my American uh, uh, analogies, if you will, and, and definitions and all those things. I will learn Australia, praise God. But in Washington, D.C., our federal government is in Washington. Many of you know that. But in other states, there are these things called federal buildings. It's not literally Washington in the place, but it's the federal government's operation in the place. Washington, D.C. is where the federal government resides and does all of its business, everything happens in that place or that realm, and then it is distributed into and through the federal arms of government in each of our states. The kingdom of heaven is like D.C. without all the swamp. Hallelujah. Where everything happens and is the will done and then it is distributed out through the other places of operation, the kingdom of God. So the kingdom of heaven would be the place that God is. The kingdom of God is where you are manifesting what heaven's desires are where you live. Does that make sense? So when we talk about the kingdom of heaven, we're talking about that everything that heaven has you have a key to it, and you carry an authority that when you access it, whether to bind it or to lose, God agrees with you from there. The kingdom of God is where you operate and you expand what God's will is from heaven. Does that make sense? Now I want you to go over real quick. Go with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 1. In order for us to shift, We've got to understand this. We need revelation. Can you say amen? And, to, and when we do this, revival and awakening will not be captive inside a building. It will be captive within you. 
and you will be the infectious agents of heaven to go out and affect all of society with what has infected you and it's called the kingdom of God. Can you say amen? I love Ephesians chapter 1, but we won't read all of it for the sake of time today. Look at verse 15. For this reason I too, having heard of the faith in the Lord Jesus, which exists among you and your love for all the saints, do not cease giving thanks for you while making mention of you in my prayers, that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, here we go, the Father of glory may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation in the knowledge of Him. Let me pause right there. Father, by Holy Spirit, is going to bring a understanding, a revelation, and enlightenment of, of who Jesus is in you. Amen. Jesus is not on a cross. He's on a throne. He passed through a cross to the throne. Jesus is not in heaven saying, Worship me, worship me, worship me. No. The Bible says He's there interceding for you and for me. Interceding doesn't mean He's begging and asking God to do things. Intercede is a courtroom term which means to present evidence on someone's behalf. Mm. Hallelujah! God, Jesus, is presenting evidence on your behalf so that you can walk out your purpose and your destiny and you can escape the traps of the enemy for your life. But He says here that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory... He may give to you a spirit of wisdom and of revelation in the knowledge of Him. He does not want you to have a revelation of religion, but of Jesus. Jesus. Everybody say Jesus. Jesus is the one we need a revelation of. Not a church, but of the King. Hallelujah. Verse 18. I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened so that you will know what is the hope of His calling. Jesus had a calling. Do you believe that? You need to know what His calling was. And I'm going to burst a religious bubble today. Jesus did not die to get you into heaven. Come on now, smile at me on Sunday morning. Jesus, the Bible says in the book of 1 John, for this purpose was the Son of God manifested that He might destroy the work of the devil. In Mark chapter 1 and in Luke chapter 4, Jesus says, I must go into other cities and preach the kingdom of God, for this is why I came. What? His purpose was to destroy the work of the devil and to preach the kingdom of God. To establish the kingdom of God in the earth. Now you may say, Greg, what about heaven? Well, you if you die, you get to go there. Hallelujah. But Jesus did not come with the purpose of establishing a place for you in heaven. Religion loves the songs. Some glad morning when this life is over, I fly away. Yeah, he's going to prepare for me a cabin in the corner of glory land. No, he's not. That's unscriptural. Jesus came to establish the kingdom and to birth sons and daughters so that we could live while we were born to live. And when you die, or if you die before He returns, you will join Him in heaven, but you will come back with Him when He returns. Isn't that amazing? Religion says all of this is so we can get to heaven. It is not. All of this is so we can get heaven and earth. 
so that when the king returns, he will be like Rome invading a nation, that it will look like heaven. Wow! You may say, well, what about the earth? It's going to burn. We've been told it's going to be destroyed. It's going to burn. It will. But not like you've heard it. Church, hear me today. We've got to shift our thinking if we're going to be effective in the earth. Yes, heaven is real. Yes, hell is real. But Jesus is real too. And His assignment in your life is real. Your gifts are not needed in heaven. They're needed in the earth. And God wants to activate you here in the earth to be a force of heaven for good. Amen. Look what it says here. What was the hope of His calling? What are... Listen, look at this next. This next line is powerful. What are the riches of the glory, the weightiness of God's presence, of His inheritance in the saints? He is saying here that the riches, the glory, the weightiness of Jesus' inheritance is in you. Isn't that amazing? Jesus' inheritance is not streets of gold and walls of jasper and gates of pearl. It's you. You are the inheritance of Jesus and more value has been put on you than anything that God ever created. Let's read on. 19. And what is the surpassing greatness of His power, His dunamis towards us who believe? That's us. There, these are in accordance with the working of the strength of His might or His power. That word power there is the word energeo, and it literally means God's creativeness. So His dunamis works in and through you to create what needs to happen in the earth. God's a creator. You're created in His image. Amen. God created all of this out of nothing. All He had was His Word. I know sometimes when I think about nothing, I just think maybe it's just all darkness. But it wasn't even darkness. It was nothing. Nothing was there. God spoke into nothing and created everything. That same power lives in you. His name is Holy Spirit. Amen. He created the world through His Word. That's Jesus. But the power of Him is Holy Spirit. Let's read on. Which He brought about in Christ when He raised Him from the dead and He seated Him at the right hand in heavenly places. Look what the resurrection of Jesus accomplished. The resurrection of Jesus, according to Ephesians here, it brought you into a place of being His inheritance, being filled with His dunamis power, miracle working power, and allowing God's inner gaio power, His creative power to flow through you. It repositioned you back into God's original plan for mankind. You are, whoa, go ahead, give Him a praise. You are not this weak, worthless sinner trying to make it to heaven the best way you can. You are the empowerment of God in the earth. Can I make another statement? You are the fullness of God. You are. You are the fullness of God. Religion says, oh no, you're just a sinner and you better be happy if God just notices you. If you give enough time, you give enough money, you pray hard enough, you try to not sin, you might get to heaven. That's religion. But the Bible says that literally you are the fullness of Jesus. You don't believe me? Let's look at a couple verses here. Look at verse 20. Or verse 21. He set him far above all rule, all authority and power and dominion and every name that is named, not only 
in this age, but also in the one to come. Verse 22 is getting better. And he put all things in subjection under his, Jesus' feet. And he gave him, Jesus, to be the head over all things to whom? The church, the ecclesia, not a building, but you, us, the body of Christ, members in particular, we are that. Jesus has all things under His feet. He is the head. Verse 23, it says His church, which is His. His body. Not His denomination. Not His religious organization in the earth that should offer incense up to Him. I'm being a little naughty. Hallelujah. But His body. The next words are so important. Look what it says. Which is His body? The fullness of Him who fills all in all. Woo! Glory. God, by His Spirit through Paul, writing to the church at Ephesus, draws us a glorious picture of who we are. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus has all things put under His feet. We are the body. We're kind of caught in the middle. Hallelujah. We're every vital organ. And all life flows from is what God said we are to Jesus. We are the fullness of Him. The church. The church. That's awesome. I don't have any other words to describe it. It's, it's amazing that, that we would be His body where the heart beats, where the blood flows from, where the lungs inhale and exhale the breath of God. The breath of God comes through you, the body. Wow. You are so important and so valuable in this move of God. God is positioning us as His ecclesia so that Jesus can walk into every community, every city, every state, every home, every life, and be the king that sits on the throne in that territory. Can you say amen? But He cannot do it without you. And you say, God can do anything He wants to do. God has chosen not to do it without you. We pray God just move sovereignly, move sovereignly in our nation. And God says, no. I will move through you. That's why him and Moses had debates. God said, I'm going to kill them. Moses said, you can't. You made them promises. And then Moses said, God, go ahead, kill them. And God says, no, I made them promises. Right? If you notice, God doesn't do things in the earth without the partnership with man. The devil can't do nothing in the earth without the partnership of man too, but that's a whole other series of sermons. Hallelujah. I want, you to, I want you to hear this. Why? Because when you leave this place today, you're going to go out different than you came in. Your assignment is going to become more real. Your positioning of authority in your homes, in your workplaces, in your schools, wherever you may be, is going to become more evident for you. You're going to begin to see more divine appointments from God. More times, kairos moments we call them. Moments that God creates for you to be you. And to release His kingdom. You're going to pray for the sick. And they're going to be healed where you live. You're going to prophesy and give words of wisdom and words of knowledge where you live and where you work. You say, Greg, I can't do that. I'm not a prophet. Good news, and I'm glad you brought it up. Write down 1 Corinthians chapter 12, the first few verses. It says that the Holy Spirit, He has nine different gifts, and He can use those gifts 
through whom he desires or wants to at any time he wills. So you don't have a gift of healing and you do not have a gift of the word of knowledge and you do not have a gift of, the, of prophecy. You've got Holy Spirit who has all nine gifts. Those are His gifts. And if He's in you, He will work through you any time you allow Him because He wants to. You can prophesy. You can give words of wisdom, words of knowledge. You can work miracles. You can bring healing to people's life. You'll have discernment where you walk and where you live. Let me tell you, life is getting ready to be good. Hallelujah. Amen. You can cast out devils. You can heal the sick. Uh, Mark 16. You'll be able to raise the dead. I'm telling you, I'm prophesying to you right now. We are in a year that we're going to see the dead raised like never before. And you're not going to have to get on the phone and say, Neil, somebody died. Come lay your hands on them. Neil's going to say, I'm fishing with Greg. You do it. Religious people would be offended if their pastor told them that. What does he think he's doing? Igniting you. Stirring you up. I'm telling you right now, this place ought to have twice the number of people in it next week than it does today. Why? Because you've gone out of this place today as sons and daughters, full of the power and the glory of God, full of the Holy Spirit, doing who God created you to be. Do you hear that? Doing who God created you to be. There is a world that is hurting, that is lost, that is struggling, that is needy, and it needs you to step up and say, God, I'm not very experienced, but just use me. Give me a word, I'll give it. Give me a prayer, I'll pray it. Send me to somebody, I'll go to them. And you'll be surprised how God begins to open doors for you, His ecclesia, to begin to bring His will in the lives of other people. Revival's coming. Oh, let me change our terminology. Revival is here. Awakening is here. God is igniting the fire of it by putting the torch of His Spirit in your life. Does this make sense today? Who is the church? We're the fullness of Jesus. Now. Not later, now. Well, we may look out of shape. Most of us do, praise God. I'm a full gospel preacher. Amen. I am the fullness of Him. But you know what? It doesn't take long to get in shape. What does it take to get in shape? Exercise. When you begin to exercise what God has put in you, you'll grow stronger and stronger and get in better shape than you've ever been in your life. And God will use you so mightily. I'm telling you, God, I just wish I could express it the way I feel it. You own your family. You and your family are on the cusp of something greater than you've ever experienced before. Go home today and stand in the doorway of your house. Stand in the living room and begin to declare, Kingdom of God, come. Will of God be done in my house as it is in heaven. Call in the Kingdom of God. Release the Kingdom of God and be the church in the midst of of the kingdom of God. Let's stand our feet this morning. Father, we give you praise today. We thank you today, Father God, for what you're releasing in us, for what you're bringing us into. Help us to catch it. Father, help us today not to miss it through just wanting a word or needing something from you, Lord, but help us to become that word and to become that release and flow of miracles. As you gave us last week, Lord, the Word that said that you're building pools this year, and you're building conduit this year to cause the river and the waters to go into the nations from this place. So, Lord, we decree over every person in this place today. There is an arising, there is a stirring, there is an outpouring of Holy Spirit in your life like never before. In Jesus' mighty name, Father, fill us today afresh. 
Come on, just lift up your hands and begin to pray that prayer. There is a fresh infilling of Holy Spirit that is coming in you right now. Father, fill us afresh today with Holy Spirit. Fill us to overflowing today with Holy Spirit. Give us boldness, Father. Woo! Hallelujah! Give us encounters this week, Father. Open doors for us where doors have been closed. Father God, give us favor where there's been no favor in our life. Give us favor and outpouring, oh God. Give us fruit. Woo! Fruit, fruit, fruit. Give us fruit, God, in our life. Give us fruit in our marriages. Give us fruit in our home. Give us the fruit of our children walking and running with you in the fire and the power of your spirit. Father, give us fruit in our workplace. Give us fruit in our government. Give us fruit in our universities and our schools. Father, we call ourselves the harvesters today. And Lord, when we step out of this place, we're stepping into a harvest field. Father, churn in us like never before. Burn in us like never before that your kingdom would come. Your will would be done on earth in Queensland. In Australia, Father, as it has been done in heaven. Thank you. Woo! Thank you, Father. Thank you, Father, for the outpouring of your Spirit today. This is the way I feel for us to end this segment of life this morning. As the worship team is praying, I want you just to turn to someone that you do not know or you haven't never prayed for in your life, I want you just to begin to release kingdom in their life. Come on, let God use you. No better place than right here, right now. Not husbands and wives together or children. Find somebody. I release boldness over you right now. You may say, Greg, I don't know how to pray. Well, just say, I bless you in Jesus' name. Come on, right now, find somebody. Find somebody. We release the kingdom of God. We release a fresh infilling over everyone today. In the name of Jesus, Kingdom of God come, will of God be done in your life like never before in Jesus' mighty name. Worthy are you, Lord. Worthy, 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 worthy. We release it. We release it. Stir them, God. Stir them, stir them, stir them. Hallelujah. Glory. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Hallelujah. Where are they going for? If you're here today and you need special prayer for something we want to invite you just to come up if not you're dismissed but if you want to if you want prayer we'll appear to pray for you we'll appear to release but it's good seeing you pray for one another hallelujah god bless you don't forget next week